thanks for coming, and I'm sure it's going to be a bit of an experience for you to be here, and for some of you, I'm sure it's welcome back. But just to let you know who we are, we're um, a history group known as Glen Ravel Project, and today it's myself and Michael Leggett are going to bring you around and show you some of the interesting historical features of the, uh, the jail. And, you know, from a history point of view, we all know that there's all different historical projects. We're just one of many. And this is just one of the things that we just want to do because, as a quote that we like to use, there's perhaps no more fruitful form of education than to arouse the interest of a people in their own surroundings. And this is one of them. The jail was opened in 1847, and we're going to explain a lot of this stuff, you know, that went on before that. Now, what we're in at the moment is what's known as the circle in the, the, the Belfast prison, because that's what it's known as. It's, it's only in the later years it became known as a criminal no jail. The actual title is the Belfast prison. And the way it was built, it was built during the, at the height of the famine. And it's built on a, the same scheme as Pantyville. And for anyone who's ever seen an aerial photograph, or you can even see by looking at it, what we have behind is, is what was known as the governor's house. And when this jail first opened, you know, the governor was the man in charge, but well, still are in, in many prisons. But what they always wore then was ex military, you know, there'd been corporals or sergeants or sometimes even majors in the army before they could be a governor of a prison. And the governor sometimes was also a prisoner himself because he wasn't allowed out. He had to live here. And if he had a family, the family had to live here too. And whenever you came to live with him, so to speak, you were processed through the governor's house. You came in through this way and you were processed in these rooms behind me, and then you were brought in here. And what we we'll have is going around in clockwise is A wing, B wing, C wing, D wing. And A wing's to my, my left, D wing's to my right, and then the other one's offshoots. But the, um, you have to also remember what it was like to be sentenced here at the time. You know, as soon as you came in, you were allocated a cell. And on those days, there was only one person per cell. And once you were in that cell, unless you spoke to yourself, of course, you weren't allowed to talk. You weren't allowed to do nothing. And whenever you came out, you weren't allowed to talk. You weren't allowed to say nothing to nobody. And whenever they went for exercise, which was the only time they got out, they just went out, and it was known as the silent circle because you had to say nothing, total silence, and walk around in a circle. So it wasn't a very, very pleasant place to be. And the reason for the design... Although we'll have all the security today, you know, we'll have all the grills and stuff like this put in, is whenever the governor came to do his inspections, the governor would have just walked out of his house through here and he could have looked down each wing. And from this point here where I'm standing, he could have seen every section of the prison. And it had a warder on each wing and he had just shouted to the warder, is everybody locked up or whatever his instructions were? And he had just replied, that yes. So it would have been A wing secure, B wing secure, D wing secure. And he had went back. That was his inspection done. The other inspections that the governor had done was usually on a Saturday. He had went round every cell to make sure it's spotless. Because each prisoner had to keep the cell absolutely spotless. And he had went in. And a lot of us have heard the, the infamous cases where they went in with white gloves and rubbed them on the floor. That's all true. They really did do all this. And it was really, really strict. The other thing that I have to highlight tell you is too is get the idea of a man's prison out of your head. It was only a man's prison in recent years. When it first opened, it was for everyone. And when I say everyone, I'm talking about men, women, and children. Children were held here too. And in some of the cases we're going to explain, you know, bad enough coming in as a man, but try and imagine the terror of coming into somewhere like this if you're a child. And trying to imagine if you're a child coming in, being sentenced, and on top of your custodial sentence, you were to be whipped. It must have been horrifying. And these are just some of the things that we're going to explore. You know, there's a lot of, lot of stuff went on. You know, one of the things that, um, that happened within this prison, like any prison, you also had escapes. You know, but one of the most sensational escapes was not during the recent conflict. It was actually in the 20s. And to this day, they still don't know how these four prisoners got out. You know, because what they'd done was they blocked their door, the lock on their door, and then they got out onto the landing, and they overpowered one of the warders, took his keys, which got them out of the landing. But when they were recaptured, they didn't tell them how they got from the landing to the Crumlin Road. And to this day, it's still a mystery. You know, with all sorts of escapes, <coughs> there's people went over walls, people went under walls, there's people shot their way out, all sorts. But that's the most fascinating escape, and it's one of these things that's forgot about. 
So I'll just pass this over to Michael, and Michael will just give you just a couple of wee brief words before we move round to jail. When it was open just at the time of the famine in the 1840s, late 1840s, it was the County Antrim, County Antrim Prison, and it replaced Carrick Fergus Jail, which was then the County Antrim Prison. And back then, uh, when the place opened, there was 106 prisoners already down in Carrick Fergus. And you hear all sorts of complaints today about the hard time some prisoners get. Back then, 106 prisoners were actually shackled together in chains and walked the whole way from Carrick Fergus to here um, before they were introduced to this new hotel. But Belfast, right before that, had loads and loads of prisons. In fact, uh, the House of Correction was down at Hard Street, and that was Belfast Braidwell. There was other prisons located in Smithfield, down at Henrietta Street, and the Donegal Arms Hotel, which was down facing um, International and that, down in, the, in High Street. Um, also, the Rotterdam was also used as a prison for transportation. And for a time, the caves, even up at the Cave Hill, they reckon that they were... Uh, used as a prison at some time as well by the O'Neills. But to get our burns here, we're actually standing in the circle, and as Joe said, this is like a, the circle and the wings fan out from here. And A and D wing run the length of the Crumman Road. If you're coming down the Crumman Road, you're looking at A and then D wing. D wing's right down beside the Matter Hospital. And one of the things that makes this particularly peculiar jail, and that was based on the same as Pentonville over in London, is that there's a subterranean passageway that leads from this prison over to the courthouse directly facing it. And it was built at the end of 1850 then as well, and it was opened. Um, as Joe said as well earlier, this wasn't just a man's prison. There's a birth register for the prison as well. And in fact, today would have been the birthday of a woman called Hester Brown, who was born here in October the 8th, 1870. Um, and so there is a birth register for this jail, but equally, even though we may be celebrating someone's birthday, there's a huge death register for the jail. In that death register, there are people who were executed in the name of people of Belfast, and there was other people then who died through dubious circumstances, and others who took their own lives, unfortunately, because they couldn't cope with some of the things that has happened here. It was also used as a debtor's prison, so at stages of the history of the jail itself, it was packed, or else in later years it, it, it went out of use again with only a couple of hundred prisoners. And then when the trouble started, it was packed up again with several thousand prisoners. In A wing, you have 110 cells. B wing behind us here is 130. C wing is 70 cells, and D wing is 70 cells, and with three landings in each one of them. And sometimes during this talk, you'll hear us referring to prison guards as either guards or screws or turnkeys or wardens or warders. Um, all of those terms have been interchangeable by people either outside of the jail or inside of the jail, and by no means are any derogatory. Those are terms that people have used throughout Ireland since the history of the prison system. So the next place we're going to be going to is D-Wing Base. And we're going to take a wee walk down to see exactly how people were brought into the jail if they were coming here in a prison van. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to actually look at some of the prison cells where people were before they met their, their end, before they were executed. Um, we're also going to take a walk down and through the passageway that takes you down and underneath Grumman Road and towards the courthouse. Um, we'll have a look at A-Wing. And finally, we'll go into the governor's residence itself. We'll have a look at that. And then we'll go down into C wing, where we'll, go, we'll visit the execution cell where the actual executions will take place. And then after that, we'll leave the prison complex itself and go around to the perimeter wall where all of the people who were executed in the jail were buried. I was in prison here in 1973, 1974, and 1979. Uh, prior to being sentenced, uh, three days before sentence, myself and another seven seven people out of this prison escaped, four from C wing and four from A wing. I was actually held on the fees. I had to come down the stairs and I actually got stopped here and I had a gun in my boot with a guard. Sometimes would ask for one boot off and, that, and that's the gamble we had to take. So we asked for my right shoe, that's the kind of bet you had to do, that's the gamble you had to do. Uh, we proceeded to go down these stairs where we were to meet the solicitors who were coming up and that was, that's the place was earmarked 
to uh, t take over. We were studying this thing for about six, six or seven months, where all the switch alarms was, the alarms, the many guards, the routines, the timings, and everything. I mean, I had to, everything had to go to clock, clock work. Every week we went down, we studied it. Every week when we went down, we, we kind of rehearsed things they got there. So myself and another three, three people from this wing actually went down these steps, and this is where we're going. As I said, there was, uh, there was four prisoners from A wing and four prisoners from C wing, and this was the only place in the prison where we could actually meet together. So all eight of us was actually in this small room. You can't see the lights on, but these are the cells. We were held in these cells until the barrister or, or we would call you in. One of the pr prisoners went in to see his, his uh, rep. Once he came out, I shouted out the cell, is it raining outside? And that was a code word where he got information on the outside that the road was clear, that there wasn't many uh, arm, army patrols or whatever. So once he said to me, the weather's great, that's when I pulled the gun out. When the guard opened the door, they let me out and they let him in, that's when I grabbed the guard in and I told him that he was under uh, arrest. I told him to take his uh, clothes off. Not all his clothes, of course, you know. <laughs> it was his, his tunic and his pants and his hat and his whistle and things like that there. So I took his keys over, so I represented the guards. So when more prisoners are coming down, more guards come in, I would actually let the guards in. Once they come in, we would tie them up. We were in there for about 45 minutes when we got the, when we got the go ahead, and that was because somebody was phoning down from upstairs to find out why they weren't ph phoning through. So rather in panic, the command that was our wire escape said, that's go. And we proceeded to go out into what's known as the courtyard before the front gates. And I had to approach the gate. Now the guard was on the other side of the gate. So I had to persuade him to open the door. Because he says, we need your codes. Well, I, I was supposed to bring a, a, a card code, but I couldn't do that. So the other fellow was dressed as a guard. And then we had our, another fellow who was dressed as a barrister. Of course, he had a kind of a university scarf and a briefcase. And, uh, and I said, this man's wife is next door. You know, she's, she's in the hospital, she's pregnant, and there's complications, and we have to get him out right away. And I hadn't time to go up and get the pass. And he said, well, I need a pass. And then we come right sick, this woman could be dead. So that's when he turned the lock. Now, he's on, the, on, the, on their side. So once he turned the lock, I pushed it in. And that means that we were in to uh, two, what's known as the main phase of the prison on the front gate. Once we got to the front gate, we jumped on the other guards, we tied them as up too, we got out into the Crumman Road. Once we got in the Crumman Road, there was army everywhere, police at the outside the courtroom. So that's when all the shooting started. We started firing back at each other, like the OK Corral sort of thing. So we got up the Crumman Road, we got in the car park, the cars was there for the, the escape. But of course, you know, because there was so much shooting getting into the car we run, so I actually run through uh, the Shanko Road. And I actually went to this bar called the Malvern Arms which is very famous in Shankill, and that's where I took my uniform off. There's all these high fellas who were drinking Boss and Smittick. We kind of looking when I was taking this tunic off and a hat, and uh, that's when I made my way to West Belfast, and that's where I ended up, freedom at last. Okay, where we're going to now is uh, into the tunnel, the famous tunnel that goes underneath Crumlin Road. Um, it links the jail to the courthouse, and the part that we're standing at now is where uh, officially you, if you were a prisoner, would be handed back over to the RUC or the police um, and they would take you underneath the ground here and bring you up into the court and it's at this point here is when you actually leave the custody of the prison and the prison officers or prison guards actually hand you over to the police and you're handcuffed here and you're then led across the tunnel. Um, at the height of the troubles people would have been led across here 10, 15 at a time say, um, where then they would have been placed in holding cells at the far side of the, at the far side of here. So if you just follow me down in the tunnel and then we'll continue that down here. Just at, beyond this door here behind me is where you actually go up until the courthouse where you would have been held then in holding cells before you were brought up into the dock um, to face trial or face remand or, or whatever. Um, and as I was saying, at the height of uh, the prison being open, it all, it, all these heating pipes here would have been on full blast. So the humidity actually underneath the ground here was quite um, unbearable, um, especially, you know, depending on how long it took you to get through this tunnel. 
And we've had several people along here um, who's explaining to us about sometimes there was huge fights down in the tunnel between the police and prisoners and, and various other altercations. But nevertheless, uh, some of the horror of actually getting brought down through this Victorian tunnel um, was enough to actually traumatise most young people anyway by the time they reached the court. <coughs> Unfortunately, some people who did actually come up and through the court here were sentenced to death. So what about 30 people from Belfast sentenced to death? And needless to say, then, whenever they were brought back down through this tunnel, that the walk back from here after being sentenced to death till the actual jail itself must have been one of the longest walks that some of those prisoners would ever have made. Um, 17 of the prisoners who were actually sentenced to death, the sentence was carried through, and they were all executed in Crumlin Road Jail itself. And we're going to go back down, down the passageway here, back out into the, into the Crumlin Road Jail, where we will hear a wee bit more about how those executions were take, took place and how uh, some of the horror that a Victorian prison like this instilled in people. As Joe was saying, some of the young people also who were sentenced to be brought over to the jail, some of them as young as 12, 10 and younger, were sentenced to the jail here, or sentenced to the courthouse here, to be brought over into the jail, to be flogged and held for times of six months to a year for some silly things like uh, stealing a shirt or stealing food to eat and uh, things like that there. Um, and most of those young people also would have been marched down this passageway too, through the horrible chambers and back up and round into Sea Wing especially, where they've been brought out down into dungeons which are actually underneath there. And we're going to visit those in, as part of our tour. So if you saw, use Lead the Way this time and get us all back out of this passageway. Right, folks, he's ready. Everybody okay? <clears throat> the centre wing behind me here is A-Wing. And you'd have heard me talking earlier on about um, some of the people who would have come in who were political uh, protesters in, in the, the jail. And you'd also heard me talking about the silence, the whole silence system. And there was a bunch of prisoners who came in. And as I mentioned, they were far from silent. And we're talking about even in the courts. And what these people wore was the suffragettes. And for anybody who doesn't know what the suffragettes were, they were the women who were demanding the right to vote. Now, when we hear about the suffragettes today, we think of, of England, where they threw themselves in front of the king's horse, where they chained themselves to uh, 10 Downing Street railings, you know. And that's all the stuff that we know. But they were actually very, very active here. And in fact, I would go as far as to state that they were probably more active here than what they were in, in Britain. And one thing you have to remember too about the uh, geography of the island, Ireland was all one at this time, it was all British. So I mean these people were up to everything that they could possibly think of. But getting back to the prison and what they were doing is now the suffragettes campaign outside started off with peaceful protest and then they realised they weren't getting anywhere with peaceful protest. So then they started to do things which we're all familiar with today. The main was a, one was a firebomb campaign. And the firebomb campaign was to hit two people, the businessmen <coughs> and the firehouses, or the houses of these businessmen too. And these are all the upper class, so we're talking about who they targeted. And what they'd done, well, for example, in North Belfast, they burnt down three mansion houses. They burnt down the Cave Hill Tea Rooms. In Lisburn, they bombed Lisburn Cathedral. You know, to bomb something of a religious significance was unthinkable then. But to them, they didn't care. Now, we all know about the, in later years, when the, uh, particularly in the 1920s, the IRA began a campaign of firebombing. They copied the tactics of the suffragettes. And whenever they went and done their political protests or their prison protests in the 20s, they also copied everything that they were doing. So as you're saying, women started it all. But whenever they were in courts, you know, we have photographs of, of the, the suffragettes in courts. And there's one, you know, there's a famous quote where it turns around and says about the suffra a photograph of the suffragettes on one of the rare occasions when they remain quiet. You know, so they went into court and they disrupted the whole thing. Whenever somebody went to speak, they had got up and started yelling, singing, jeering. On numerous occasions, they threw stuff at the judge. 
They even got their own defence papers and threw them. They just didn't cooperate with the court because they refused to recognise the court. Now, in later years, whenever the IRA prisoners were being in the courts, they refused to recognise the court because they said it was British. Whenever the suffragettes went in, they refused to recognise the court because it was all men. And it was all men. There was no women judges, barristers, solicitors, nothing. There was no women even on the jury. Women weren't allowed basically to do anything. And whenever you look back with hindsight today, you can actually see that the suffragettes were actually right because they were treated like, the women then were treated like dirt. And, you know, they were right on, on what they were demanding. Now, whenever they were brought into the prison, as I mentioned earlier on about the prison, there was a whole silent system. They didn't stay quiet in the jail. They just didn't cooperate at all. And as soon as they were brought in, they were brought to the wing, A wing, which is the wing which we're talking behind me. And whenever they went on the A-wing, they just continuously banged, shouted, yelled, sang, just continuously made noise in a shift system. So you, you can understand where they couldn't make noise, all of them together at one time, so they'd done it in turns. And they threw them into the one wing, which was A-wing. But it didn't do nothing, because you can hear me talking today, and you can hear me throughout the whole prison. So try and imagine what a group of women banging their doors and singing is going to be doing to the whole prison. They also developed another tactic which became known in later years the political protest, and that was a hunger strike. But whenever they went on a hunger strike, it became known as cat and mouse, because whenever they started getting very ill, they were let out. They were let out to get better and told to come back, which was pretty weird. But whenever they were told to come back, you can understand they didn't. And what they'd done instead was the date that they were due to come back, they hired out cars and they drove around Belfast. The reason they got away for that was because the police wouldn't arrest them, because they realised the hassle that there was in arresting the, the, the women, because there was just nothing but hassle. What's your name? Start singing, yelling. Uh, where you go? It was just constant hassle for them, and so they wouldn't arrest them. They didn't want them back in here, because they were, well, as they explained, a bleeding nuisance, and they just can continuously done that. Another protest that they also developed was what later became known as the No Wise protest. They just refused to cooperate. They just didn't do nothing. And whenever we hear about all these things today, which as I pointed out earlier on, you know, whenever we hear about the conflict over the past 30 years and we hear of uh, no wise protests, we hear of hunger strikes, these were all done. And this is 1914, 1913, 1914. Now, the other thing that the suffragettes done, we all know that uh, one of the people instrumental in the creation of uh, what's now known as Northern Ireland, it actually was, believe it or not, the first name was actually meant to be Carsononia, after Lord Edward Carson. Now, he was, the thought he was going to become the Premier of Northern Ireland, but he was getting old and getting on a bit at that time, and he didn't want to do it. But the reckon that the, the, the only reason was he didn't want to do it was his fear of the suffragettes. So whenever Northern Ireland was being created, you know, try and imagine that um, the IRA were a pretty strong force at the time. You know, they just won independence for what's now the Republic of Ireland. And up here there was a, a civil war going on where, where hundreds were being killed. But Carson, in his, own, in his own writings, had always stated that the one set of people that he feared the most was the suffragettes. And the reason for it was, was because they were out to get him. Because he had made promises to them that um, whenever we get a new state, whenever we do this and whenever we do that, you will have this, you will have that. And then like any sort of, well, I suppose we could describe it as a normal politician, just went back on his word. And they never forgive him for that. And, well, that obviously they didn't get him. History tells us that. But whenever you're, you're reading anything about Lord Carson, always read in between the lines and think that the fear, I mean, whenever we're reading it, we can all just automatically assume that the fear that he had was of the IRA. The fear that he had was of his suffragettes. And as I pointed out, history is not as black and white as what we think. <clears throat> you know, whenever we hear about hunger strikes, whenever we hear about no wise protests, whenever we hear about uh, the refusal to or recognize the court, whenever we hear about economic firebombing campaigns, the suffragettes started all that. And this is just Belfast. So try and imagine what was going on in the whole of Ireland, particularly Dublin. You know, so they were very, very active. Needless to say that um, the women eventually got their vote. And today, whenever we're looking at it, it's interesting to note that less than 33% of women actually vote. You know, but they got their vote and they got their way. Now we'll have women magistrates, we'll have women judges, we'll have women's and juries. But just think of that there, you know, and this happened here. This happened directly behind where I am. This was the wing where all the suffragettes were held. 
So whenever you're thinking about political protests, political prisoners, they were the first. It wasn't the Republicans, it wasn't the Loyalists, it was the suffragettes. So we're going to move on to, I think, D-Wing. Okay, where we are now is D-Wing base. And this is where you'd have brought, get brought in after being processed to reception. You'd have been brought round into here where there's baths and people would have been scrubbed and deloused physically before they were brought in to the cells down at the end of this wing here. Um, the cells at the end of this wing is where you'd have been held underneath the prison until the governor was ready to bring you up until the wings up, up above into one of the four wings. And, space would have been made available for you down whatever wing it was you were to go to. So you'd have been held down here sometimes over the weekend, sometimes for a wee bit longer. Um, some of the most infamous people who were held down in here were held just on beyond <coughs> this swing at the very end of it, down near the punishment blocks, and uh, that would have been the supergrasses. And the supergrasses were held down in the bottom of here because it was the most secure place in the jail, if not in the jail, probably in the whole of the north or in the whole of all of these islands to keep them because obviously they were uh, well wanted men by a lot of people. Um, the privileges that the supergrass has got though were completely different from the privileges that ordinary prisoners would have got and so some of the wardens in that who were explaining to us about how they had to guard them were actually had to be on their best behaviour and say yes sir no sir to the supergrasses otherwise they would have been put on report and moved to another part of the jail. Um, obviously, no one wanted to mess about with any supergrasses because their evidence was vital till the Crown prosecution. So they done everything in their, in their effort to make sure that they gave evidence, like ordering them Chinese food and pizzas and all the rest that was delivered to them. They had snooker tables and all sorts of privileges down in here, as opposed to some of the cells that we're going to visit here. Um, as Joe was saying, like this jail... Uh, Today, I suppose, it has lighting and heating. At the time, whenever it was built in the 1840s, it wouldn't even have had window panes. So it would have been quite a um, horrible place to be. I suppose it's still a horrible place to be, but back then, if you can imagine, there was no lighting, no heating, just straw in some of these cells. Um, and as well as that, then there was a whole mixed population of men, women, and, and young children in here as well. Um, so we're going to take a wee walk down in to uh, one of the cells down here because one of the most famous people was actually led out of here, one of the very first people to be hanged at Crumlin Road Jail. And I'm go we're going to go down into one of the cells where we'll, we'll go into one of the cells down in here at D-Wing and we'll go through his case and some of the, the horror um, that's associated with a capital punishment in Belfast. In 1854, the very first person was executed in, in Crumlin Road Jail. And I suppose my interest in local history, um, in Belfast local history, I suppose most of, the, of my, even my imagination of what Crumlin Road Jail would have been like, would have been formed by some of the songs that people sang. And at one stage I always thought Tom Williams was the only person to be hanged in Crumlin Road Jail. And it was probably because it was the only guy there was a song written about. But when I found out there were 17 people actually executed here, and I more than that even sentenced to death, I was horrified because... Uh, some of the cases actually are quite traumatic, but they're fascinating in their own right. And that the very first person who was executed in criminal jail, like Tom Williams, was a teenager. And like Tom Williams, was a soldier, except he was a British soldier. And he was a British soldier who was sentenced to death for shooting a guy called Corporal Brown down in Victoria Barracks in the New Lodge, where the New Lodge flats are now. And Corporal Brown, if any of you are interested, if you go, ever go up the Shankle Road into the Shankle Graveyard, just as you go through the graveyard gates, Corporal Brown's buried just right at the gates. And I suppose what happened was him and uh, this young fella called Robert O'Neill got into an argument. And Robert O'Neill, over polishing boots or something it was, and uh, Robert O'Neill shot him with his musket. And Corporal Brown died. And a big, long and laborious uh, court case took place and he was eventually sentenced to death and he was held here at the Crown, in, in this wing, perhaps even in this cell, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I suppose you can feel that on your back. Well, in 1854, in Belfast, when Robert O'Neill was about to be hanged, 
there was public executions back then. And if you can imagine the jail back in 1854 would have been out in the countryside, so to speak. The closest districts would have been like the Pound, Lone Air, Carrick Hill, down and around the New Lodge, down and in, in and around the docks and that. But up here would have been fields. And further on up the road, the mills wouldn't even have been built at that stage. Ardoin Village would have been there. And then on up above that would have been Ligonil Village and then right out over the hill. So it was all fields. Now, in 1854, Robert O'Neill was sentenced to death. And he was brought out of this wing to be hanged in front of the jail. There was a public scaffold. 20,000 people turned up on the day to have a look and see this guy getting hanged. I suppose if there had been hamburger stands and ice cream vans, they all would have arrived at the same time. Um, you know, so there wouldn't have been much difference between what happens in Iraq today and what happened here in Belfast. And I would dare say that if all these are from Belfast, it would have been your great-great-grandparents would have been part of that crowd. With their more of a curiosity to come down and watch someone being hanged. Mm -hmm. um, do you know what I mean? So that's how close it is to our families and how close it would be even to people in Belfast and Belfast history. The strange thing then about it though was at that time the Crown Prosecution could not get anyone from the island of Ireland to perform the duty of an executioner. And so they had to bring an executioner in from England. The executioner was brought across to Dublin, say, on the boat. And they had to hang a couple of people in Dublin. Then he went round and hanged a couple of people in, you know, Waxford and Wicklow and round by Cork, round by Galway. And at that stage he had hanged about 30, 40 people till he came to Belfast. At that stage, poor Robert O'Neill would have been sitting here waiting on him coming to, hang, to deal with him. But unfortunately, the hangman, he had paid pick, pick a pretty shilling for every person he hanged. And so he was worth a couple of bob by the time he arrived in Belfast. And he went out in a piss. And he ended up, when he was drunk, tried to beat someone to death. And he was sentenced himself then to GBH in the crumb. And he was sentenced to, to be in here. So on the day that Robert O'Neill was brought out, at the very end of the wing here, just at the Matter Hospital, that's where the scaffold was built. And he was brought out on that morning. And his last request was to be wearing his army uniform. Because he said, look, the thing was an accident. He served his country. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't a criminal. Um, he, you know, he was a soldier. He was brought out on the scaffold. And the hangman then, what they did was the sheriff opened the hangman's cell door and brought the hangman out in his prison uniform with a mask on. And he came out on till the scaffold, and they hanged Robert O'Neill. He hanged Robert O'Neill. A common criminal hanged a soldier. Mm -hmm. And all the people were throwing tomatoes and fruit and everything at the hangman. And the crowd got so uh, boisterous that the, the army had to bring in an extra battalion into Belfast to deal with the crowd. And that was the very first person to be hanged in the jail here in 1854, Robert O'Neill. I suppose where you are now is probably one of the most horrible places within the jail. And it's down in the dungeons underneath the ceiling. And uh, I use the word dungeon because some of the passageways down into here would remind you of a scene out of the Monte Cristo films. You know, you're waiting on someone trying to uh, get away down into the river. And perhaps if you can imagine that one of the stories for this place, for one of the people that was executed, they say that that's how they did escape. That um, the person that was allegedly hanged was switched around and the person was brought down to here, brought down one of those passageways which leads right down into High Street underneath the prison. Some of the people then who were hanged here was, one of the most famous people was a man called Eddie Collins. Now, Eddie Collins' story is, if you thought the story about uh, Robert O'Neill was fascinating, the story about Ro Eddie Collins is absolutely one of the most fascinating stories down in here. The reason why I say that is... Uh, Eddie Collins was the only Jew to be hanged in Ireland. He was the only American citizen to be hanged in Ireland. But strangely enough, he was the 13th prisoner to be hanged in this jail, and he was hanged on Friday the 13th. So all those things, when they come together, you think is quite strange, except uh, the actual story about how he ended up in here is even stranger again. Eddie Collins 
uh, came to the notice of police after a dead body was found in a field. And even this finding of the body had a whole lot of supernatural connotations to it. It happened in the 1930s, and what happened was uh, a milkman was coming along by Carrick um, and the horse and cart, and the horse refused then to go any further and it stopped. And no matter what he did to try and make the horse uh, go any further, it wouldn't go any further. And he happened to look over the field, and there in the field was a, a body. Not only was it a body, it was a, obviously a dead body. Not only was it a dead body, it was a dead body of a giant, eight foot tall. Um, to make matters even more peculiar, it was a dead body of a giant, which was absolutely naked, no clothes on, wearing a pink bathing cap with a bullet hole in the back of his head. Now, you don't get murders like that these days, um, especially around these parts. Um, and so needless to say, the police thought that, God, this would be a very easy one to solve, because you don't get many giants wearing bathing caps slamming on fields these days, you know. So um, the detectives anyway soon went about their business to try and find out who this guy was. And they narrowed it down to uh, a guy called Eddie Collins, who was seen with him having a bet down in uh, Celtic Park. And he was seen in around Belfast travelling along with this guy. And they tracked Eddie Collins down over into England anyway. They interrogated him, brought him back. And it transpired that Eddie Collins and the guy who was found in the field were part of the circus. And they were travelling around uh, England and Ireland with Bertram's circus, um, with a peculiarity called the oldest man in the world, who was allegedly 156 years of age. And they were all part of a syndicate. And what happened was, whenever they went to the circus, people paid in to see this guy, and then they split the money three ways. And so it was the police's uh, calculation that Eddie Collins murdered the giant, so that then the, the money would have been split two ways instead of three ways. And so he was prosecuted and found guilty. The difference with uh, Eddie Collins and most of the other people who were killed in this jail is that Eddie Collins refused to admit his part in this from the very beginning right till the very end. On the morning of an execution, you could have heard a pin drop right throughout this jail, which would have been quite terrifying, not only for the prisoner that was about to be hanged, but for every other prisoner who would have been in a jail. And the morning would have started off for the prisoner at around 7 o'clock when they came to, to give him his breakfast and prepare him to be killed. A priest would have come in or a chaplain came in and said a couple of prayers with the victim um, before, before he was hanged. And then you'd have heard the shuffle of keys just prior to 8 o'clock, because all the prisoners were hanged at 8 o'clock precisely. And you'd have heard the shuffle of the keys and the footsteps coming up the jail, up the wing landing, and the doors opening and the gates opening and closing. And at that stage then they came into the cell, to which then they had presented the prisoner to the sheriff, and the sheriff then would have, you know, said cheerio to the prisoner basically. The executioner would have come in, along with the executioner's assistant tied the man's hands and feet, brought him in until just directly above our heads here now. They would have put the rope around his head, around his neck, put the hood on, brought him over till the middle of that. And before they had pulled the lever, they would have asked him, do you want to say you're sorry or repent to God before because this is it? And usually they would have said yes or no or I did it and I'm sorry. And it's allegedly that Eddie Collins said that he had didn't have the blood of this man on his hands and he was innocent. Nevertheless, they pulled the lever and he went down into this room. So his body would have been left hanging here for an hour to make sure that he was dead. And then a post-mortem would have been carried out. Um, it would have been carried out down and underneath the, the belly of the jail, so to speak, in secret, so that no one could see what was happening or the complete horror that would have is associated with such executions. And in fact, some of the people who were completely against executions like this would have been the hangmen themselves. And people like Pierre Point and people like that who got the name of being real horrible people um, were actually some of the most vociferous people against capital punishment. So, you know, so this actual room in Jesus Stanton then is probably one of the most saddest places probably. Um, in Belfast, and it would certainly be one of the most horrific places in the jail, because this is one of the most, you know, this is where 
some of the most terrifying acts actually happened in our name. The last hanging was 1961, and it was Robert McLattery. He was hanged just a Christmas week in 1961. And he was the last person to be hanged. He wasn't the last person to be sentenced to death, but he was the last person to be hanged. And after we leave here, we go and see where they're actually buried because all of the prisoners who were hanged, according to law, have to be buried within the confines of the prison of which, in which they were executed. Right, folks. Well, for one of the things, even for the benefit of the, the video camera, you know yourself that one thing about can't capture in film is the actual feeling that you get down here and the feeling from the cell that we just left. You know, because we all know that at least 10 people breath, breathe their last breath in that room, you know, and it's horrifying whenever you think of that. But whenever you're in the cell and you actually get that almost supernatural feeling, it's, it's, it's very hard to explain. But as you know, we're down in the, uh, the dungeons, really, of Crumlin Road Jail, because when we think of dungeons, we think of people chained to walls and stuff like that. But dungeon just means underground, and we're actually underground in the, uh, the prison. Now, we heard about what was done in that cell when people were hanged and taken out, but down in the actual dungeons, there was other horrific deeds carried out as well. And earlier on in the tour, you heard me mentioning about um, floggings, weapons, and this is where they were done. Now, up until recently, we didn't know exactly where they were done because there was no real record of, you know, there was just a record of them being carried out, but not where they were carried out. But fortunately, recently, we came across a document, a letter written by a prisoner who was fortunate enough to explain exactly where it happened. And the place where it happened would have been, for example, one of the rooms behind me. And it was actually down in the dungeons where the floggings and weapons took place. And I'll just tell you briefly what the, uh, the letter was, really. And what happened was, in 1921, an ex-soldier named James McAlorn, who was accused of assault in a public house, and he was, even despite flimsy evidence that it wasn't him, sentenced to three years imprisonment and added 15 strokes of the cat. Now, whenever we hear that today, we just think, no, 15 strokes of the cat. But think nothing of it. But you try and imagine your sentence the 15 strokes of the cat, how terrifying that was. Do you know what I mean? That must have been scary. The thing about McAlorn's letter is what he describes afterwards. And he states, what was, so, what was especially memorable for the victim was not so much his own beating, grotesque as it was, but the predicament of a teenager who followed him to his cell. The child prisoner who despite begging the prison doctor to intervene and save him from the cruel and more unmerciful punishment, suffered the same fate. It was within the Belfast Police Court that one of the most tragic cases of suicide in the prison's history began. On Tuesday the 27th of April 1858, two young lads named Patrick McGee and Joseph Muir were charged with stealing some clothing from a washerwoman named Jane, Jane Ray. The act of theft was proved by a little girl who lived with the woman. The boys both wept bitterly and stated that, if forgiven this time, they would never make their appearance before the court again. As McGee had been before the court on previous occasions, he was sentenced to three months imprisonment and to be whipped by the prison hangman. The boy was take, taken crammed from the court to begin his sentence, but unfortunately it was also the beginning of a terrible tragedy which started almost as soon as the boy entered the jail. And the following is a report which appeared in the weekly Northern Whig on Saturday the 1st of May 1858. A little before 3 o'clock, one of the most tragic cases of self-destruction that has ever been our lot to record took place in the county jail. Whether we take into account the youth of the deceased or the circumstances under which the event took place, we are warranted in stating that a more determined case of suicide has rarely occurred in a prison. The boy, for he was only 12 years of age, who thus stopped short his career, was known as Patrick McGee and was sentenced on the books of the head constable, or sorry, he was entered on the books of the head constable as a suspected character. Just remember what I said, 12 years of age. And it was considered necessary to send him to prison for the welfare of the community. <coughs> McGee was brought up before the preceding magistrates and charged by a young woman named Jane Ray with stealing from her house in Ballinafay some articles which she had obtained from her customers for washing. Upon the evidence presented, the magistrate sent the prisoner to jail for a term of three calendar, month, three calendar months and to be whipped, a sentence which undoubtedly brought horrible termination to the life of the young lad. 
While the case was going on, the boy stated that, I'll be glad off this time, I will be a good boy and never trouble you again. And when the magistrates told him they had no doubt of his guilt, he stated, while weeping bitterly, I had no dinner yesterday. My father is dead these 16 weeks, but I'll never be here again. Whether the bench could not pity the poor boy under such circumstances, we shall not pretend to say, but the stern rigour of the law was enforced upon him and he was sentenced. The long term imprisonment and horrible whipping no doubt affected the mind of the child, the child prisoner with gloomy, gloomy foreboardings of what was, he was to endure, and the sad end proved to be he would rather put an end to his life than endure the continued stigma of a felon. When brought to the county jail, as is usual in the establishment, the prisoner was locked in the cell appropriated to him. At this time, although the prisoner appeared downcast, there was no apprehensions on the part of the officers of the jail that he would put an end to his career, as they appeared to regard his present fate as only customary in life. And once again, I'll go back, 12 years of age. The officers of the jail saw no reason to suspect a suicide on the part of a boy of such tender age. The boy was locked up in his cell, the time other prisoners in the jail passed to their dinner, but on the warden again proceeding to examine the several cells, the unfortunate youth was found hanging dead from a hook in his prison cell. Now the thing that's tragic about it is that here we had a 12 year old child who was so terrified of getting whipped that he strangled himself to death. Um, what I'm just trying to point out to you here is that um, you know, we know about the hangings, but for me personally, and I'm sure a lot of you will agree with me, I think this has to be about the most tragic death that occurred in this jail. You know, and it's just to give you just an insight into what occurred in here. You know, two things I would point out. One, he wasn't the only suicide, there was lots of suicide. And two, he wasn't the only child suicide because the average age of children committing suicide in this prison was 12 and 13. So it gives you an idea of what really went on behind these walls in Victorian times. This in later times was a classroom, as you can see from a blackboard and all that on the, on the wall. But this cell was the actual condemned cell, where the prisoner would have spent his last days. And while he was in this cell, there would have been prison warders along with him on the death watch to make sure that he didn't kill himself. Um, and so this is where it all would have happened. Now, we were downstairs looking up at the actual trap door and the trap there would have been a door here in this wall which brought you actually into the execution cell now this is a condemned cell and then next to it was the execution cell so this is the last couple of weeks say maybe waiting on his appeal coming through to see was he going to get let off and brought down into an ordinary wing or into an ordinary cell or was he actually going to get brought through that door and dropped down into the base so we'll go up up to the other one here is where the execution cell is. Right. This is the actual execution cell. So where you're standing for is roughly where the door was, the trap door. Okay. And if you can imagine, that ceiling is a false ceiling. That would have went right on up until the next landing, and that's where the rope would have come right down to here. Okay. Um, there was a secret doorway here in the wall, and they took that doorway out. They pulled the cupboard across and that it just marched your man right through with the hood over his head and just stood him there. And then would have said to him, you know, have you anything to say before we carry out the sentence of death? And he was given the opportunity then to repent or whatever, you know, to make his peace with God. And so, and then he was hanged. Of all the 17 people who were sentenced to death here, the were all men. There was no women executed at the jail. Um, I don't know why that was, but no women were actually hanged in criminal jail. It was all, what, 17 men were hanged here, and two teenagers, Tom Williams and Robert O'Neill. You know, and some of the people who were hanged wouldn't have been sentenced to death in today's courts. You know, it would have been manslaughter or, you know, there's yeah. far, far more, there's far more reforms today and more liberal way of looking at things than what it would have been back then. Back then it was very much retribution. Having said that, in the north of Ireland, only the 17 were hanged here, 
Um, at the same time, when Tom Williams was hanged, 73 Republicans were killed and executed in the South. Um, elsewhere in Britain, I mean, there was hundreds and hundreds of people executed. So even though there's some people are of the opinion about the Stormont regime was horrible and, and all the rest, it was quite liberal when it came to capital punishment and, and stuff around prisons, believe it or not, compared to the rest of Ireland even, even in Dublin or Cork or anywhere like that, or London or, or Scotland, you know. Here was, uh, you know, if you were sentenced to death here, there was a good chance that you would have got off, or you wouldn't have been hanged. But unfortunately for 17 people, that wasn't the case. Well, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on what way you look at it. But this was the execution cell.